I'm here to talk about Terra Genesis, uh, which is a game that I made mostly on my own, but it's become successful enough now that uh, my wife and I were able to build a company around it, and now we've got three employees and growing. And it's all based on the idea of using real science in the game um, to accurately reflect what it would be like to colonize and terraform planets. So on the off chance that anybody here is unfamiliar with the term terraforming, terraforming is the process of taking a planet like Mars where you have to wear a spacesuit to survive and you thicken the atmosphere, you add oxygen, you add water, you turn it into a planet like Earth where you can just live out on the surface without any special NASA technology or anything. So it's always good to start out with a quote that's not from Confucius. Um, but a lot of people here have probably heard this quote, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. And that's basically the whole premise of, of Games for Change, is interactive experiences that teach people uh, either information or empathy and, you know, ways to, to change the world. Um, definitely not from Confucius, it was coined by some school teachers in the 1960s, but whatever. Um, <laughs> But as I imagine a lot of people here have come up, across, uh, come up against, there's also a widely held belief, which is that I love learning, but I hate being taught. And that's something that I think everybody has experienced at some point, that it's more fun to learn on your own than to sit in class or something like that. And of course, a lot of people don't even agree with the first part. <laughs> they don't think they like learning at all. They want to just have fun. And so that's something that obviously I think everybody struggles with probably in this room, and I certainly was struggling with when I wanted to make a game about the realistic challenges of colonizing Mars, because there are a lot of them, and you're, you need to learn about them. But luckily, what I realized is anybody who says they don't like learning is just lying to themselves, because any time you play a game, you have to learn the map. You have to learn what the gun does. You have to learn what the user interface does and what is the difference between sticky grenades and frag grenades and everything else that goes into the game. And of course, that's not even counting games like Hearts of Iron where you basically need a PhD to play it at all. <laughs> so, who am I? My name is Alexander Wynn. Like I said, I founded Edgeworks Entertainment off of the success of a game called Terra Genesis. I'm a self-taught programmer. Um, I've been making apps just in my free time because it's fun. And finally, my 25th app was Terra Genesis. And it has gone on to be successful enough that this is now what I do full time. Uh, I'm a space nerd and a history nerd and just sort of an all-purpose nerd. And one of the things that I love doing is communicating how much I love this stuff. You know, teaching people what is cool about science and what is cool about history because it's awesome. And too many people don't get that. So the story of Terra Genesis started when I first saw the trailer for The Martian. So if anybody here has read the book The Martian or even seen the movie, you know that a lot of the cool part of The Martian comes from the fact that there's real science all throughout it. The challenges that he has to struggle against are real. And the solutions that he come up, comes up with in the story are often way more complicated than anything that the audience members are going to keep up with. You know, these are complicated uh, chemistry issues or, or dealing with electrical engineering and that sort of thing. But it's conveyed through the story in a way that entertains and you learn along the way. So when the trailer first came out, I had been thinking about a game about colonizing Mars for years. And I thought to myself, you know, if I was smart, I would have my game about the science of colonizing Mars available on the App Store when this movie about the science of colonizing <laughs> Mars came out. Um, the problem was that that was in a month. Um, and so I got to work, and I actually did it. I made a crappy little game about colonizing Mars in a month, but it was a crappy little game. It wasn't very fun. And so I went back to the drawing board, and uh, about 11 months later, um, I had this. And that's very dark, um, but hopefully you can see it well enough. Um, this is rendered in-game in Terra Genesis. This is an image of Mars using actual data from NASA, height maps and surface maps. This isn't a fictionalized red planet that is just sort of rolling red hills. This is actually what Mars looks like. That's the Thales Marineris right there in the front. And in the game, 
you do exactly what you need to. You start warming up the planet, you start thickening the atmosphere, and all of a sudden Mars gets clouds. You start introducing water onto the surface, and you start to get oceans. These oceans fill in the lower elevation areas first, based again on actual topographical data, so you're actually seeing what oceans on Mars would look like. The oceans continue to grow, you start to add biomass onto the surface, and the terrain starts to turn green. And by the end, you've got a fully terraformed planet that is actually what Mars would look like. Not just you took a red planet and turned it into a green planet, but you took Mars as it exists right now and you turned it into Mars as it could actually be. Wrapped it up in a game over the course of several months. Um, this is actually an old app icon, but, uh, but yeah. Released it and it became TerraGenesis with the tagline that we developed one year, one developer, one million players in our first year. And there are a bunch of reasons, I'm sure, but we were getting messages every single day from people who were so excited about the science. And so that, in a roundabout way, is what I'm here to talk to you about. I've come up with three ways that TerraGenesis uses real science and that anything can use real science or real history or real anything to educate players without teaching them because that, for some reason, turns people off. So, so method number one is the big one in TerraGenesis. And this is don't teach it, assume it. The game is not about learning about Mars. The game is a, is a builder. It's, it's very much like SimCity. <coughs> Along the way, though, you have to know certain things. You have to pick up on certain things. This is an image, again, from the game. And we're using actual textures for every world. Those are the actual clouds of Venus. That's obviously the actual map of Earth. We've got all the moons of the gas giants. We've got all the inner planets. We've got dwarf planets. We've got everything in the game based on real data. The atmosphere, the surface temperature, the oxygen levels. Sea levels are pretty much not a thing, but where they are, they're accurately rendered. And this just primes the user to pick up on these things. So this is the stats page in a game of TerraGenesis that's going quite well. Like I said, the, the key metrics in the game are temperature, air pressure, oxygen levels, sea levels, and then biomass once the planet can support it. And all of these things are done using real units of measurement that scientists actually use. The temperature is measured in millikelvins. The atmospheric pressure is measured in pascals. We didn't need to do that. We could have atmosphere units. You need 10 clouds to terraform this planet. But why? Use Pascal's. Use the real thing. Because now there are millions of people who know how to measure air pressure and who know that Earth's air pressure is 100,000 Pascal's and that you need 21% oxygen to be breathable by humans. And all of these sorts of things, not because they were ever taught it, but because that was just the goal in the game. And if they wanted to beat the game, they had to keep these numbers in mind. And of course, this method number one, don't teach it, assume it, is done in a lot of other games. The Civilization series is famous for this. A lot of people, when they first played their first Civilization game, probably would have identified this, game, this guy as the Monopoly guy. <laughs> but now they know what Teddy Roosevelt looks like, at least kind of. A lot of players wouldn't recognize Qin Shi Huangdi, first emperor of China. And they wouldn't be able to tell the difference between Cleopatra and Montezuma, even though they come from opposite sides of the planet. You don't need to know these things to play civilization, but you just pick them up along the way. And so then, when you go back to your history class and people start talking about the Aztecs, you're like, oh wait, I know about the Aztecs. They killed me. <laughs> <laughs> I hate those guys. <laughs> And then you might need to l unlearn a thing or two because, you know, the Aztecs beat me with jet planes. <laughs> but, but, you, but you have a framework. You know, it's all about making connections. And when you have these initial connections that the players are picking up on just from doing their thing, not from learning, but just because that's the way the game is, it begins that foundation and the player never notices that they're gaining a greater appreciation of history. And of course, the greatest example of this in video games is the Assassin's Creed series, because every game takes place in a new historical era, and you're exploring roughly realistic cityscapes and landscapes, 
um, aside from Unity, they even use the actual accents of the places. So you get a flavor for, oh, this person is clearly not from around here because he sounds different. You are able to literally climb all over historical buildings. And who knows how many players are out there wandering around right now knowing exactly what the Duomo looks like and where to find it, not because they've ever been to Italy, but because they climbed up the outside of it in Assassin's Creed. And again, this is not an educational game. This would never be billed as something to play in the classroom, although I wouldn't be surprised if it has been played in classrooms. But it's not marketed that way, and nobody gets turned off because of it. It's all pretty much optional. If they fictionalized the you know, Renaissance Europe more than they did, not many people would have objected, but they didn't. And that's what makes it so powerful as a teaching tool. This is a, a user-made collage. Every single person in this image is a historical figure from an Assassin's Creed game. They're basically never underlined as such. You could play through whole games in this franchise without recognizing that any of these characters are real. You just sort of assume it's a video game. They're all made up. But they're not. And you're learning about these characters as you play your way through. And then later, when somebody comes up to you and is talking about, oh, you know, Calico Jack in the Golden Age of Piracy, you remember that guy. And they've peppered in little things throughout the game. Oftentimes, these games are actually anchored along significant historical events that the player has to kind of play around rather than playing through. And so you're learning as you go. So that's the number one and also the most common and oftentimes the hardest way of doing what I'm talking about because it does mean that you actually have to integrate this kind of thing into your gameplay. I got, e I got lucky because in Terra Genesis it's mostly numbers and so you're presented with a fairly easy choice of do you want to use real numbers or fake numbers and yeah, let's use the real numbers. Um, obviously it's harder to recreate Venice um, but it's a very potent tool. The second technique that, that I uh, have been figuring out as I've been working on Terra Genesis is make them earn it. So in this, we're drawing inspiration from Tom Sawyer. And anybody who doesn't know this story, a famous scene in Tom Sawyer, he's been punished because he's been skipping school, and so his, uh, he's been punished with the task of whitewashing a fence. And he doesn't want to do it. And as he's working, very glumly, Another boy comes along and is like, ha ha, you have to work while I get to go out and play. And Tom says, well, I mean, you know, you couldn't handle this job. And he's like, what do you mean? And he starts to present the idea of whitewashing a fence as something that really only the best kids are trusted with. I mean, come on. And by the end of the scene, Tom has a line of kids that are waiting their turn to whitewash this fence and paying for the privilege just because of how he has framed the job. He hasn't lied to them in any way. He hasn't changed the nature of the job. He hasn't even gamified it. He's just taught them to believe that this is something that you gotta earn. So in Terra Genesis, we have a system called the Biosphere. We rolled it out last February. It's incredibly complex. It's probably more complex than the rest of the game combined. It is a fully featured ecosystem simulator where you as the player build a global ecosystem species by species, starting with microbes and then plants and then herbivores and then carnivores on both aquatic and terrestrial tracks. Each species is not picked from a list of species. You don't just bring wolves to Mars. <laughs> you engineer them gene by gene. So you say, I want to create a terrestrial mammal and then I'm going to take the genes for cold adapted nocturnal, and social behavior. You have now created a wolf on Mars. But you could just as easily say, I want to create a terrestrial rat reptile. I'm going to add large, large, and flying, and have dragons on Mars. Because why wouldn't I? <laughs> it's an incredibly complicated system, but it is by far the most beloved system in the game among the fans that play it. But you know what we did when we rolled it out? We said, oh, the biosphere? That's really just for experts. <laughs> and this is a way of gating out people who would be intimidated by the complexity. Play a few games first. Learn how Terra Genesis works, and then you can tackle the biosphere. But it's also a way of teaching people the simplified version is for the casuals. If you really know how to play this game, 
you're going to play it the realistic way. You're going to do the real thing. That's how the true hardcore gamers act. And it works. People work toward the biosphere. They share tips on how to create the best species. And they start engaging with these ideas of biodiversity. And why does it matter that the bees are disappearing? Well, it's because I had bees on my planet, and when they disappeared, everything went to hell. So we've built this system where all of the genes that you're dealing with are realistic. The phylums that you're dealing with are realistic. You know, microbes, you're not just creating a microbe. You can create diatoms or actinobacteria or cyanobacteria, and they have realistic repercussions, um, realistic attributes. So the third method that we use in teragenesis is also the easiest to do in any game, and oftentimes the most fun, because it doesn't require a lot of integration, and that's unnecessary details. So for example, we have this again. I wasn't able to get this animating. It's just a still image. But if you were to see it animating, you would notice that everything is orbiting in one direction except for Venus, which is orbiting in the other direction. And we actually get bug reports every so often from people who are like, guys, uh, it's not a big deal, but Venus is going the wrong way. Mm -hmm. Except that Venus actually does go the wrong way. Venus has what's called a retrograde rotation, where it orbits the opposite way to all the other planets. We're still trying to figure out why. But that's true. It impacts the gameplay not at all. It has zero impact in any way. But it's accurate. So let's do it. All of the planets in Terragenesis, all of the moons, like I said, use realistic topography. The only time we fictionalize it is if we haven't mapped the other side of that moon, which has happened for certain moons. So I had to hire an artist to be like, this is what one side of the moon looks like. What do you think the other side looks like? <laughs> so that kind of thing, just peppering in these little details. This is another one. When NASA announced the TRAPPIST-1 system, seven Earth-like planets orbiting a single star, every science fiction writer's dream. <laughs> when they announced it, they were smart enough to recognize that you need to have an illustration of this for people to really get what you're talking about. And so they released the top image. And it was great. And it made headlines. And it was huge. We rolled out TRAPPIST-1 as, as playable planets in Terragenesis. Now, we had no idea what these planets look like. All right, we have, we have detected these planets in the sense that the light from the star flickered a little bit. We have no idea what the surface of these planets looks like. But I was able to recreate the image that NASA released. Because again, it just builds this understanding of realism into the game. It's not, you know, mandatory. I could have just as easily done a completely fictionalized world. In fact, it probably would have been easier because I wouldn't have had to recreate that shit. Um, and it would have been able to play into the gameplay a little bit. I would have been able to craft the levels according to the way the game works, instead of being constrained by what an artist did without any idea of a game being built around it. But the fact that it had this realism built into it, people still talk about it. We released these a year ago, and people are still like, whoa, this looks just like that thing. We've actually had people, I think three or four times, People had messaged us sort of coyly, kind of awkward, and be like, guys, listen, I don't want to like start anything, but I think NASA stole your images. <laughs> um, <laughs> which is just about the most flattering thing ever. Um, so there are also examples of these throughout other games. You know, this is Civ 4, which is fantastic. Um, and there's a lot going on, and you'll notice every once in a while as you play, you get a great general character. And they build it as great generals, and it comes up, and you get a pop-up that says, a great general has appeared. But when it's on the map, it's not just a great general. It's Zukov. <laughs> that is a specific general that existed in the world. And again, that has no gameplay implications. This unit does not work the way Zukov worked in battle. He has no tactics or anything like that. He does not even just show up for the Russians. Anybody can get him. But the fact that Zukov's name is right there helps players to build this understanding of the world. And then again, as they start to encounter these names, they will start to get more curious, build a better understanding. So, you know, we started with quotes. It seems only fitting to end with quotes. Leonardo da Vinci once said, learning never exhausts the mind, and that's a lie. <laughs> that is a dirty lie. But what it ought to say is that learning should never exhaust the mind. It is unnecessary to exhaust minds while teaching people. You can create 
really deep, substantive learning experiences just by peppering it in to a game that players would never think of as educational. But by peppering in these details, you can convey a lot of information. And what's more important than that, you can make them love learning. You can make the players really get into it. We've gotten messages from people who said, I use your game in my science class. Or I chose my major based on this game I downloaded on my phone. It's amazing the impact that you can have. So that's Terra Genesis, and that's what I've got to say. If you have any questions, I'll be around here for a little while. You can take a picture of my contact info, shoot me an email. Terra Genesis is available on iOS and Android right now, so you can check it out to see for yourself how well you think we did conveying real science. Thanks for listening.